So, first of all, actually, let's take a step back. I wanted to call this presentation originally Salvation from the Trenches of SQL. And I think that's an appropriate title because as we go into it, you'll see exactly what these trenches entail. I want to start with something that Brian Will once talked about. Oh, can everybody see that? So the idea is that he had this great presentation where essentially he talks about OOP and the nature of OOP. And the idea is that, so we learn about OOP from these nice little things that have nice analogs to real life, you know, cat extends, animal, etc. And then what ends up happening is that we have the real world with manager factories and the like, but this is a verb. These things are verbs, right? Like all the Java programmers are going to be like, it's a verb, it's a verb! Oh no, we're Java 8 now, we know all about verbs, we flat mapped a couple of lists, you know? So the idea is actually this isn't a verb, this is a verb chaperone. That in there is the verb, right? This wonderful anti-pattern is what the entire spring framework is built on. Um, great little paper there called Execution in a Kingdom of Nouns. Essentially talks about all these verb chaperones for every single major uh, Java framework. So there's a very similar kind of disposition that exists in the SQL world, which is, so here's the SQL theory, right? We've got these nice little mapping types, and we just map things to other things, and everything is solvable with some SQL, some simple SQL statement. Here it is in practice, right? We have just a bunch of really complicated stuff in here that needs to be traversed. And the problem here is that this is a verb, unlike those things over there, which are nouns. And this thing, right, the mapping between accounts and customers, or many things that we end up dealing with, is complicated, and it's an artifact of a structure of an entire database schema. So, you know, we, we're engineers, we know how to do the stuff inside here, right? That's what they pay us for. Now, when we do it correctly, it looks like this. Right? All of these components have specifications and they can be replaced by any other component like this that meets the specification. When we do engineering wrong, it looks like this. Right? Like what other kind of parrot can we replace that parrot with if it dies? Right? What kind of other cracker can we use there for this device to work? Like this parrot has to be insured by Lloyds of London for a crap ton of money. Right? And the problem is that when things are constructed ad hoc, as this device is right here, right, the problem is that things tend towards greater and greater complexity, as opposed to something like this. Now, here is what that ultimately looks like. Right? This is what that, this is what that looks like. Where do you start? This thing is a giant Rube Goldberg device, essentially, right? We have account codes and account client codes that get propagated first from like inside of here and then down there and then up there. Like, what the heck is this, right? Right? In Soviet Russia, database queries you, right? Welcome to Gulag. Come for the paycheck, stay because you can't find your way out. Right? Oh, somebody say we want UML. Ha <laughs> ha, I give you UML. Here is UML. Does it help? I don't think so. <laughs> right? You understand this? I don't understand this, and I wrote it. Right? So hold on, let's take a step back. Let's try and condense some things. Okay. So we've got some stuff that we're selecting inside. We've got these merchant clients and these service clients, and we select them on some common fields. And we have this registry that we need to filter or slash join it on. And these four fields, code, alias, permission, tag, right? These guys come out. They need to be mapped to accounts in some kind of interesting way. Whether it's directly or whether it's through a label or whatever. And then at the top of there, we need to express that information ultimately. So let's, let's dig into this a little bit more. Um, Okay, here's what's going on inside the middle, right? We have merchant clients and service clients that ultimately go into some kind of object there that we abstractly called a client. Again, because this is a Rube Goldberg device, there is no contract on what this thing actually is. It's just, you know, the thing that will pass this query without, 
you know, the SQL throwing an exception. Fine. And we join up on the registry. The difference is that in the latter one, we get the code, the, uh, sorry, the, um, the order permission from the partnership. Imagine that we have, right, service clients and merchant clients typically. Let's have a look at the data a little bit. Okay, so the funny thing here is trying to make data that is actually rememberable and understandable. Um, you know, for example, think of Kruger and Voorhees Alliance as Freddy and Jason, F and J. Right? And, uh, and those guys, right, because Freddie and Jason tend to use specialized hardware like chainsaws and machetes and need to have that hardware replaced at a fairly tight SLA because of heavy usage, right, we need to join that up and ultimately we need to express it out. So here's, here's what we're actually doing, right? So the only difference is that for one of these we grab it directly from the table, the other we grab it from the partnership. In practice, the column will exist there, but it'll be null, and the reason it exists is because of hibernate mappings. Right? Our schemas are given to us most of the time, right? The entire of hibernate is a giant anti-pattern. But anyhow, I'll second that. that was an opinion. <laughs> should I ask questions or should I hold? Please, go ahead. When have you ever held? I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn. <laughs> I've never really asked that before. See? <laughs> would, you, would you say that this is a graph? Um, inside of here, it's actually a tree. Because there is no cycle in here, right? But there could be. Um, no, there could not be. There could, there could not. not be. Like, technically, what I should be doing is in this registry, this is the registry here, I should make a copy of this here and a copy of this above that this guy points to up here. Right? This is not, this is not a tree, this is not a graph, this is strictly a tree. You cannot have cyclical things here. So in a, a, huh? a cyclic graph, that's all. Right, there we go. Well, a tree is a graph. You know, prove that, prove that, uh, what is it, n, n plus one nodes and n edges is a tree. It's proven if and only if both ways by induction. But anyhow, so, Let's actually look at this thing besides for the stuff in the middle, right? I think we kind of got that. So let's, let's look at this stuff, right? So there are certain accounts, for example, taxes and adjustments, right? Everybody's got to pay their taxes, even Freddie and Jason, right? Everybody needs a tax account, right? So these are, this is the stuff that's mapped to everyone, the AUNV and the TUNV, the taxable and the adjustments, right? And then we need other stuff. We need other kinds of mappings, right? And then we map stuff based on the tag. For example, right, so in this case, we have anything that has that tag. By the way, that's the way that we control the types of things that are being mapped. Anything that has that tag, match it on the tag and spit it out, right? And then we have some examples of that. YOG, YOG Schwartz, think of space balls, yogurt, Schwartz, etc., right? Um, that's his accounts. So anyhow, let's take a look at the last kind that exists. There are certain accounts that are dedicated. For instance, Acme Inventory, right? Um, things, that, things that need to be mapped directly. Clients that need to be mapped, or accounts that need to be mapped directly to clients. So we have this kind of variation as well. This is, these are abstract mappings, right? So, okay, fine. We have all of these wonderful abstract mappings, and we have this gigantic beast of a query. How the hell do we make this understandable? No. Ah, but you do. <laughs> Hence, slick, right? But we'll get to that. How the heck can we possibly simplify this? Well, let's, let's just take everything and let's move it to the with clause that's at the top of the query, right? Right, we'll just select everything in a with clause and everything will work correctly. Here's how. Right, does, is this actually simpler? Right? <laughs> Maybe. We moved all the crap from inside here to up there, right? Has that actually done anything? Don't think so. Ah, what is the next thing the DBA says? Use views. So here are views, right? Okay, now this is starting to become understandable. We create views for merchant clients and service clients, create a view for a union, and then finally take the rest of the crap that we've got and join it down here, right? And all is well in the kingdom until it's not. And suddenly we need to have other business units and other markets, right, that have slightly different requirements. So for example, for one, Say we have a European business unit, where those 
client codes, notice that back here, uh, service clients, right, the code for every single service client is EV. EV as code, right, because all service providers are evil, right, the entire service industry is evil, but not the European one. Say the European service industry can not be evil, right? So we're joining up from a from another table that needs to get that. Oh, and Canadian, the Canadian business end of things, over there, we don't have any service clients, right? No service industry in Canada. No offense, sorry. Um, that was an opinion. <laughs> um, right, so, okay, fine. Here's how we do it for EU. There we go, we join up all of our views there, and of course we need to create all of these new views, and now we've copied all of our code. All right, well there's Canada, right? Notice that for EU we have this thing called partnership codes, highlighted in red, right? We join that up and return the partnership code up there. And for the Canadian, we do a simplification, essentially we remove one of these, we don't need the union view anymore. And here's what has happened. This is what the code base used to be. This is what it, it has become. So essentially our code base grows with literally the size of the variations that we have. Right? So essentially it means that we have O of N technical debt. Like implicitly. Right? Because imagine that we need to change this final view that's been expressed here. Right? Imagine that we need to, you know, order permission is not just an A or S. It could be A, S, or P, dependent on some other conditions. We suddenly need to change, let's see, uh, let's see, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, right? So we accumulate technical debt at O of N with this kinds of stuff. So what is the next thing our wonderful DBA is going to tell us? Oh, use UDFs, right? UDFs are the next thing they're going to offer. All right, fine. Well, the first thing about UDFs is in most RDBMSs, UDFs create temporary tables, which immediately kill the optimizer. What's a UDF? A uh, user-defined user function. Few. Yeah, sorry, user-defined function. Um, Store in, procedure. Basically. It immediately kills the optimizer, right? Because the optimizer needs to execute the UDF in order to load a bunch of crap and then pull it back out. But imagine... We don't even have that problem. Imagine we happen to be using one of the few databases that doesn't have this issue, that literally has parameterized views. So there's our parameterized view, right? We can pass a market into it so we don't have to replicate it for every single business unit, right? So here's our, here's our American clients right here. And here's the union inside where we're joining them up right there. Here is our European clients. Notice that all that merchant clients UDF is in blue because we just reused the one that we created here. But, oh, wait a minute. We still need to create a new one for the enhanced service clients because it needs to have the additional join. And then on top of that, we need to recreate this entire thing anyway. Right? Because we can't actually parameterize the stuff that we pass into this guy. You can't pass a view into a view. Right? Because there's no contract on a view, which I'm getting, but before I step ahead. Um, same thing with Canada, right? We have to recreate this guy again. Higher order views. Ah! <laughs> voila! So here's our code base increase. We still have increased it, roughly speaking, by this amount. Right? Have we actually solved anything with these UDFs? Don't think so. So let me, let me actually describe. Describe what we want that would actually solve this problem. What we want is this. We want this definition of a client thing. A client thing that's actually a table that has these four fields that we saw earlier, right? And we want to have our UDFs return this kind of client table, and this final view put it in. So essentially, if we had that, all we would have to do is add this thing right here, and we would be done, right? Here's what the whole thing would look like. For the US, we would do this and compose these guys via union. Right through the EU, we would have the enhanced one. And with client accounts, for Canada, we would only have the merchant clients. Right? And essentially, our code base size would only grow with the number of features. Sorry, this is a mistake, that should be that. Um, our code base would only grow with the number of features, and that's what we want. And that's a scalable code base. 
this client accounts function that you've defined, which SQL code is being abstracted into that? So basically, what we are doing is we're saying the stuff that's coming out of here, right? This thing is defined as in some kind of abstract entity that takes a client. What kind of client it takes, we don't know yet. We're passing it in as a function argument. Right, you're passing like a lazy pointer to a table. Voila. Um, only, here is the problem. There is no database that does this. Why? <laughs> Ask the people who wrote SQL. Is it, is it possible and they just didn't do it because they didn't know? Theoretically. I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea why, why databases are better than they are. <laughs> right? Before we get there, before we get there, what's the next thing that our, that our DBA or manager or whoever is going to say? Just use Hibernate, right? We all know how to use Hibernate, right? Well, we can make our entity mappings like that, and we can take our... This looks good. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's great, right? How the hell do we compose these two? We can't. You cannot compose two, two HQL queries. But that's okay because well, Java people don't compose things. <laughs> can you logically compose them? Well, you can logically compose them, but... Hibernate has no means by which to do this. Yes. What are you saying? Well, how now, about your Java code? Huh? How about your Java code? So, yes. That's what we're about to do, right? Okay. So, here we have our other stuff here. From the mapping side, we need to join, like we saw before, we need to join the account types, we need to create queries for all of our account types, and voila! This is the composition! <laughs> Yay! Yay! No! <laughs> well, no, this is our query log! Okay. Oh, whoops! That it. happens! I don't miss this at all. <laughs> right? Right? That happens! <laughs> and, you know, and we tried! We tried! We made all of these HQL queries! We tried getting everything that we need to get! Only it didn't happen, right? Th this problem has not been solved! <sighs> what about criteria queries, right? Everybody loves criteria queries. Here's what I'm doing at the top. Here's, right, this is this, right? Can anybody understand this? I can't. Right, what the hell is this doing? The problem is that ORM does not give us this kind of, this kind of API. It does not give us this kind of paradigm. It just pretends that this kind of paradigm mostly doesn't exist. Um, it's a great paper, or a great blog post that essentially talks, it compares, you know, ORM to Vietnam. Or essentially, you know, the, the amount of tractability on your solutions gets less and less and less and less, and the curve goes like that. Um, so, we need to step back for a second, and we need to take a look at, at the heart of what SQL is. Can we reason about what SQL is on a higher level, and just step back from, step back from just the syntactic elements of it? Well, here's our monstrous query a little condensed again. Now, let's put on our functional programmer hats on for a second. When a functional programmer looks at this, what does he see? Well, he sees a coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> um, after the coffee break, like give him enough coffee, you know, like four or five shots of espresso, what will he see? I you know? Too many new lines. There should be one line there we go. There we go. Around the corner of the room. You know, like, like when you put on your matrix glasses, what do you see? Well, here's what you see. Anybody see Lando's. something? Right? Oh, we just returned four fields at the top. These guys up here are merely return arguments. Everything else inside here is just stuff that happens in a context. Look, this is just a lambda function. It doesn't take any parameters in, but it returns stuff. Oh, and by the way, this is... This is a on, right? A join happens on an on. It's just a lambda that returns a boolean. Same thing down here, right? We're just doing that, right? What about, what about out here in the union? We're just doing that, right? We're just taking two lambdas that return something, and we're returning something else that has that same type signature. What about down here? Well, it's the same thing, right? Accounts. Accounts has these data members, right? We can go all the way to beginning and see that. 
But that's the accounts table right there. Right? We also have we also have the account types table and we also have the dedicated accounts table. Right? Those are just other things that return tuples of things. Those are other lambdas. And we join them on other lambdas that return booleans. Right? This is what SQL is. Oh, and then up here, the whole thing just returns a tuple of strings. This is what SQL is. What are these things? What are these things really? Well, they are just lambdas in a context. What's a lambda in a context that has a unit function, right? Select of one or select of select, or, or for example, that associates, right? Select, 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 doesn't matter which order. Or for example, or for example, uh, what's, what's the third law there? Oh, bind, right? Select of select is technically a bind, right? What is this? What is this? Ta-da! <laughs> That is what that is, right? And we know how to compose them, right? Here, this is what it is ultimately, right? These things are isomorphic, right? These are just monads. These are just monads inside of monads inside of monads. How do we compose monads? Like this. And here is what this thing actually is. Almost the same, right? You can go to this and you can understand, probably even better than here. You can understand what the heck is going on by looking at that. Oh, and by the way, it returns a query of a tuple, that record that we saw back in the beginning, right? In here, this guy up here, string, string, char, string, that is what this thing returns. String, string, char, string. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I grade it out because I am actually lying. It is more complicated than that. I will explain what I'm lying about a little later. But basically, it is that. Now, let's take a look at the service clients. Almost the same thing. Again, we need to join on the partnerships, on the partnership table, and we need to get the service codes, right? Almost the same thing. Where's the return bool? Uh, return bool? Oh, these guys. Yes. Yes. These are the booleans. And equals and equals. These are just the boolean things. I'm sorry? Those desugar into with filter calls or something. Yes. 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 Um, oh, you're just saying that inner parenthetical form is a boolean lambda. A boolean expression. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. And in fact, right, this thing can be abstracted out. And you can have a function that's called in here, which we will do yeah, shortly, absolutely. right? This is understandable. You can look at this thing and you understand what it's doing. Um, and here's the greatest thing, right? Notice this US market, right? That we can't really pass inside of here unless we do UDFs and all sorts of, all sorts of sorcery. Look, it's just an argument up here, right? Compare the U.S. market. Here, compare the U.S. market. Right? No more sorcery. This is just a function. Now, let's review, right? Merchant clients, service clients. Here's the union. Right? You just have one record that returns a query of a tuple, another record that returns a query of a tuple, so you can take a union. And the compiler knows that that's valid. We doing good so far? Let's take one more step. Oh, take a look. We can actually abstract the entire tuple out. And we can create an object that has that. In like this is called the monomorphic mapped class pattern or whatnot. Um, Quill doesn't have this feature. Unfortunately, Quill is another framework that's an alternative to Slick. Also a very good framework. Bit younger, a little bit more easy to get started with. So if you're getting started, I suggest you do Quill first and have a look at it, and then go to Slick. Um, Slick has some more features, but Quill is easier to reason about, especially if you're starting Scala. Um, so here's our composition. Now, let's step out. We need to have this giant, horrible thing down here. 
Well, how do we have this giant horrible thing down here? We have account types, dedicated account types that need to be mapped in all sorts of funny ways. Follow the code, right? Blue to blue, non-dedicated accounts up here to right there, green to green down here. First we just do a right join and then a left join. The left join syntax in here is a little bit more quirky, but gets the trick done. And then, finally, when we need to join everything together, oh, take a look. All of these little horrible case statements are a little Boolean Lambda function that we returned, right? This guy, right here, this just returns a Lambda. Look at that. Integer, unfortunately, we need to do zero one check in some databases. It sucks, like, because of SQL Server. It can't, it literally cannot return a Boolean column. Don't, don't get me started. But this is why you need to do this crap. But this is a Boolean. <sighs> so, there it is. We have abstracted this out. We can use Turing complete logic to build up these case queries depending on certain conditions. This introduces tons of flexibility. Now, here's the thing. Notice, what do we pass in? What are we passing in? What did we return here? Client. Query of client. What are we ultimately passing in here? Query of client. There's our composition. This is ultimately what it looks like. I'll explain the render function in a second. This is what it looks like. This is real composition. Finally, right, what the pattern that I like to use here is that once we've composed this entire thing down here, what I like to do is I like to return all the tables joined in the proper way. And then the final result that gets expressed up here, you can take that and you can abstract that out again. So ultimately we return a query that has these tables joined in some fashion. And this is a construct that we can pass around. And ultimately, the fields that we need to pull out of this thing and return to our client, we can determine later. So, let's do that here. That's really slow. <laughs> You've been waiting all night to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Puns <Sorry>. are welcome. <laughs> what can I say? What can I say when I get there? That'll be really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running out of jokes, so please. That's why I thought of um, I appreciate it. So, passing a query that has all of our tables inside. Oh, and just pull all the fields out. There we go. We've pulled all the fields out. And then ultimately, this is what we have. This is what the entire thing reduces to. Welcome to a real language that has real composition. Right? Now, what about our requirements? The extensions that we needed to do, let's revisit those. Ah, so, service clients enhanced, right? Because again, not all European, not the entire European service industry is evil. It depends on who they're partnered with, right? Because you pull that up from the partnership codes, right? Okay, we have a service clients enhanced UDF. And we can do them with these two. So we've reproduced some code. Can we do better than this? Right? We are, after all, in a real language that has real composition. Can we do better than just replicating the code? As a matter of fact, we can. We can pass a Boolean field inside that gives us some additional information. So at the top, clients and partnerships, we join them up. Right? We get everything out of there that we need with this additional nice little field that in the case that we want partnership codes, oh, we can use this guy here and join it up to this guy here and return the partnership code. If not, just return our static value. So essentially, we have encapsulated all of the functionality that we need into one single function. And again, this can be decoupled into multiple functions 
right? These things can be decoupled into separate services, into separate libraries. We are in a real language. Right? The world is your oyster now, in a sense. Ah, let's keep going. Here we go. Service clients dual. This is the function that either returns the enhanced service client with potentially non-evil service industry codes, or the regular one. And then for the Canadian one, just returns the merchant clients. This is the union here. All right? Composition. This is a real language. We can do real things in this real language without accumulating a mass amount of technical debt. Ah, let's go one step further. Notice here that we've used the registry to filter the merchant clients and the service clients. But notice that none of the registry fields actually come out. Do you see any fields from the registry in the stuff that comes out? Up there? Down here? Registry is just a glorified filter. Why can't we have something like this? We want some kind of filtration function. Something goes in, something comes out. We want to parameterize it. We want to make it generic. Only question is, right, we need to filter by the registry, and the filter is effectively a right join. How do we know what field to join on? So how do we know what field in the registry table to join on the merchant or service client, right? Because we've parameterized it. This is a generic now. Well, here's how. All we need is just another lambda that pulls that field out. So, pulls out the alias field. So, here's what that looks like. Let's create our little filter by registry function up here. And now, and this is, I'll explain all of the weird quirky stuff with the shape level in a minute. And now, once we have that, we have some kind of function that pulls out a field that needs to be joined to the registry alias. Just happens to be that it's alias on these two tables, but it could be any field. Right? We've created this generic filtration by registry. And take a look. We just use it twice. So effectively, we've simplified again. We've abstracted really the majority of stuff out. You use this kind of thing, and guess what? A table of something comes in, a table of something comes out, you tell it what field to join on, and it's as though nothing has happened. This is perfect encapsulation. Later on, it gets evaluated into SQL, and you know all this crap eventually turns into SQL. But as far as our abstraction is concerned, literally, straight filtration. Nothing has changed about the signature. We don't have to think about what is going on inside of here until we do a bunch of unions and the optimizer and the database breaks, right? <laughs> right? This is encapsulation. What, what did you just say about the optimizer? Well, because it's SQL at the end of the day, if you do really nasty stuff in here, you could break the database. But that's due to bugs in the database. Or it's due, or what it's due to is slick generating um, a massive amount of SQL that the optimizer has trouble yes. chewing, chewing on. That's actually more likely, is that the way that you've decomposed this, you've decomposed this down into such fine units that when you combine them, yep. the slick can't produce optimal SQL code out of that. Yep. Why? Okay, and because it's just not that good yet. But it could someday. In theory, it could. In theory, it could. right? But in practice, it doesn't, and so you can hit an edge case yes. where what you get is a huge blob of SQL. The optimizer just chokes on in some databases. 100%. But you didn't have an n plus one problem, so you're well, halfway there. It's not that kind of problem. Right? You can, you and can it's, also get even optimized SQL can blow up because of you know can, can, uh, physical constraints of hardware. Oh yeah, right. So Obviously, all all of the stuff that we've like had, that. all the stuff that we've had. In the past, we still have all of the constraints, right? Just because queries are monads now, right? They're not actually monads. Very few things are actually monads, right? Whether they associate and have unit functions is ultimately based on the transaction isolation context. However, keep in mind that try is not a monad either. Success is a monad, but 
but it's a data issue. Um, and yes, as Brian has said very aptly, the danger here, this is amazing power, but there is also amazing danger because this abstraction gives you the impression that nothing has been done, but it has been. And so if you have, especially if you have a lot of unions up here in your filtration and a lot of unions down here, essentially they will break optimizers. And that's the biggest problem. When you're using these kinds of things that completely encapsulate stuff, watch the amount of unions that you have. But anyhow, let's, let's explain this a little more actually. Um, notice that flat shape level thing up there. Is there a laser pointer here? Oh, I wait, hold on, what's this? Oh, wait. I should have been using this the entire time. This guy, right up here. What is this? Why do you need to have this? So, this is essentially a type class. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a type class. And the type class essentially types this guy. Um, again, this is a limitation of slick. Quill does not have this limitation, which is, again, if you're new to this stuff, I suggest you try Quill first. Um, this type class down here types this guy, and you need to know, ultimately, when you actually call this thing here, what is coming out. Because we don't have any polymorphism that essentially says, oh, this stuff that's coming out is actually possible and doable. That's where we start having to use type classes. And this is why, essentially, a system like this ultimately cannot be written in a language like Java that does not have the ability to do type classes. Or, I should qualify that by saying it's just way more complicated. Um, because you can't prove that this thing is one of these. And you can't prove that this thing can turn into the thing that comes out appropriately. So, when you look at this, you can see this thing is the guy that goes in, from here. This thing is the guy that comes out from here. This thing is this thing, this thing is this thing. Usually they're not the same type, and if filtration function they will be. So have you, pre presumably, I haven't used this stuff in Slick for a while, but presumably there are some existing implicit evidence, but have you had to write your own to satisfy some of these filters? in what you're doing? To satisfy a filter, never. Okay, so the, the implicit evidence provided by the slick package has been sufficient for you? Yes. Okay. That said, I have written my own implicit evidence. I've done things like, um, for example, create hlist based uh, tuple functions right. that have more than 22 arity. Um, you know, I've done things with dates and other type members and did that, but for a filtration function like this, Never had to write my own. Anyhow, so, some caveats. I mentioned this thing before, this is actually a lie. And it's not even this thing, right? Slick gives us some null safety, it tries to give us some null safety, by essentially wrapping all of the fields that it can infer from the database schema are nullable into optionals. The problem is that it doesn't stop here. We need to wrap this with representation objects, right? Because these equal, equal, equal things, right? What is this actually? Where is this coming from? Well, it needs to come from somewhere. It needs to come from, in this case, a monad somewhere. So we need to wrap them with representation objects. And this is the part, and this is not it. Here's the part where I really hate. This is the part that I really hate. You need to specify all of these guys here that are in the lifted variation and the guys that ultimately come out as the record, and this is annoying. So whenever you see a type signature, such as, for example, query, or sorry, not this one, this is the exception. Um, for example, this guy here, further up, this is actually this. No, this, right? Fortunately, Scala's type inferencing takes care of this for you most of the time. 
until you start writing sub functions that you're using to factor some of this stuff out. Yes. Which yes. Which is why every slick program I have ever written that does that has type aliases all over the fucking place. So, <laughs> I've actually figured out a way to get around this. Um, mostly by using their monomorphic case class pattern. And then when you use that, it kind of does everything. It doesn't kind of, but you can get to the point where it's not insane. Um, I can show you, you know, code later on that where I actually have this stuff. But you can use this kind of pattern and you don't have to write type annotations everywhere. Um, definitely not ideal, but what's funny is I actually wrote a parser and generator that generates these guys. So technically you don't have to look at them. Again, some of the old paradigms that we all hate, such as the, um, you know, say the, uh, the uh, XML DOM binding thing that creates your schemas out of, out of uh, annotated objects or objects out of SLS and that target slash generated directory, right? Some of this stuff, those paradigms help with this. They don't solve this, but they help a lot. Um, again, Quill is very nice because Quill stays up here. Um, or here. And that's the nice part. Because it uses macros to wrap its stuff, you do not need this kind of nonsense. Um, so, this is what you ultimately have to deal with. This is the cost. And, yeah, type inferencing does a lot of this for us. I dare say most of it, at least in my case. So, conclusions? I like to call it no ORM, which is what Scala does. Um, no ORM, no ORM Vietnam. Um, and here are the URLs for these guys. And ultimately, I think Scala is the language of the future because it solves not only the newer problems in great ways, but some of the older problems as well. Thank you.